Good morning. I think we're live. I think, as Antonia said, this the Facebook gods are smiling on us today. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I'm Meg Riley. You've joined us for another episode of The View. I'm excited today that we will be welcoming Paula Cole Jones, who is a mentor and friend and teacher to many of us. And we're excited about that conversation. But first, I'll just say it was 85 Monday and it's 45 today. And that is October in Minnesota. Aisha Hauser, how are you? Hi, I'm Aisha Hauser. I'm in Seattle, Washington. And it's cold for Seattle, like it's the 50s. So people have scarves on and uh, they're getting ready for winter. Um, so no, it hasn't been in, uh, sunny. I mean, it's been sunny, but not, not warm. I'm going to actually be on the East Coast next week. I, I won't, I'll miss the view. I'll be in New York City, and I'll be preaching at Fourth Universalist, which I'm excited about. Uh, where I hear, uh, you will let me know, Michael, if it is still in the 80s and 90s, so I need to know what to pack. So you'll let me know, I suppose. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino uh, joining you from Mount Kisco, New York, where fall has arrived. Um, it was 90 yesterday, and it's 50 today. So uh, we, we had the 40-degree temperature drop, but... Um, as well, and I'm so glad it's finally fall. And I will be, as you come to my city, Asia, I will be in the Adirondack Mountains soaking in fall. So you will be training my UUMA and Lareda chapter while I am on vacation. And I'm very upset that I, I'm gonna miss you. I'm so Asia. sad, I'm not gonna get to you. hug you. Yeah. And Antonia, you are in, in Delaware today. How are you? I am back in Wilmington, Delaware. I got back at about 5.30 this morning um, because I woke up at three something. So I said, I might as well start driving now. Uh, I am doing well. It was 80 something degrees here yesterday and the high is 67 and the low is 63. So 60. I know you're coming, Asia, and I'm not going to be there. Mm, it's kind of sad, <laughs> but aren't you going to be there um, when the view is on? I'm going to be, yeah, I'm not going to be on the view. I'm going to be in, in New York City doing the workshop. I know. I'm going to be here. Yeah. And I would say maybe Margalee can be here, but I think she's also in that chapter, so. Well, shoot. Uh, <laughs> Christina Rivera is at a doctor's appointment unexpectedly this morning. She's fine. She promises she'll be here next year. She says she's not ghosting us next week. Did I say next year? I meant next <laughs> <Yes>. week. <laughs> and I also will be out of commission next week. So we better get some folks to be here because we have a good guest coming. I will be with the retired ministers next week, also out east in Connecticut, who are exploring 50 years since Stonewall. And I'm one of the speakers about what's been going on with you use about GLBT issues. So shoot, Christina, Christina better be back, but we'll, we'll have a good show next week. I'm excited about it. But meanwhile, anything going on in UU land that before we get to Paula that anyone wants to um, highlight this week? I got nothing. It's been a quiet week. Yeah. Although, I mean, I need to just name a little bit of national politics. I've been, I returned to NPR after over two years hiatus because I can't, but now I'm like, oh, there's something great to listen to, <laughs> which has nothing to do with UU land. I just wanted to throw that in. Yeah, there, it is, it is interesting to, um, to watch temper tantrums happen and to, um, to look at some people coming along who actually are talking about meaningful policy. We can only hope and work hard for that election. Well, speaking of national politics, Paula Cole Jones has been in Washington, DC all this time. Paula is a lifelong member of All Souls Church Unitarian. She has years of experience as a management consultant and um, much with the government and also much decades really with Unitarian Universalism. I'm trying to remember when I first met you, Paula, but I'm thinking it was about 1992 or something. I mean, you've just been at this work so long, always insisting that racial justice be connected to all other social justice endeavors and issues. And Paula is a contributing author to Justice on Earth, 
and the editor of Encounters, Poems About Race, Ethnicity, and Identity from Skinner House. She also, and we will be talking about this, is the co-author along with Bruce Pollock Johnson of The Eighth Principle, an institutional call to build the beloved community. Right now, Paula serves as interim congregational life staff for Surge, the Central East region of the UUA. But Paula, you've had so many hats on over the years, but all of them have involved working with congregations and regions and clusters around issues of racial justice. And I'm really curious, how, how long would you say you've done it? And what have you observed over these years watching UU congregations and working with us? Yeah, Meg, let me pause one second. I got a late checkout and housekeeping is at the door. So let me see if I can put them off for until the end of our program. I'll be right back. Sorry, bad timing there. Wow, that was anticlimactic. Yeah, <laughs> Let's sorry. just start with Michael and Asia. Say when you met Paula first. I'm curious. Geez, well, it has I, um, a bit of a drum event for me. Maybe, oh wait. I'm sorry, it just I served uh, the UUA uh, national staff as director of young adult and campus ministry from 2001 to 2007. And um, Paula was doing consulting with the congregational life group when I came on board in 2001. Oh, uh, and well, timing so, is everything. So, <laughs> so I That's guess okay. 2000, 2001 for me. That's great. We were just sharing when, when Asia and Michael met you. Antonia, have you just met Paula now or have you met Paula earlier? I met Paula doing this and I am so excited to have met her. We've had some great conversations. Yeah, I look forward wonderful. to continuing to have them. Well, that Thank is you. life with Paula. You never have a conversation with Paula that you don't walk away thinking in new ways. So <laughs> if you can remember what happened before you had to go to your door, I was asking about what you've watched with the congregational work over the years. Right, over the years. Um, so, you know, it was interesting. I remember um, in the very beginning of this, um, before I really had strong connections with the association and knew the resources that were available. Uh, in my home congregation, we had just gone through a crisis that was very sensitive racially. And out of that, we started um, to have dialogues about race. And it was very interesting because people were saying, well, it wasn't about race, but it was so obvious that whatever happened, uh, race was a part of it, but the impact was clearly, clearly, clearly racialized. So I'd let them just say what they had to say, and we did the work anyway. And from that, I, I um, was connected. Oh, you're with... a little bit soft. Your voice is just a tiny oh, bit soft. Maybe okay. you can get a little keep my mic Thank closer. You. I was connected with the Jubilee training, um, about 80 people around, uh, at that time it was the district, had come together at the church in Annapolis. So that's when I started meeting some of the national trainers and uh, saw this resource that was available to do what I was trying to do by myself and welcomed the training in uh, that was at that time called Creating a Jubilee World, which was the first part of the Jubilee training. That would have been 1999. And um, I saw immediately the value of it, and we have been using that training as our core training, the, the actual Jubilee training, ever since. Uh, so what I've seen, what I would almost have to say it from two perspectives, one, my home congregation, and then two, the wider association, uh, because I've done the work consistently at home. It's kind of a laboratory in a sense. Um, but also why, why work nationally if you're not working on your local congregation, right? Um, and it, we entered this with the question, uh, you know, around the tipping point. And actually, I first heard about the tipping point from Mel Hoover when we were in one of the Jubilee Advance leadership um, trainings in Chicago and with Crossroads Ministries. And... Um, the idea of the tipping point is if you can get enough people 
to accept a new idea, way of doing things or product, then it will take on a life of its own. It's the old critical mass theory uh, made more contemporary by Malcolm Gladwell. And, um, and so that was the question. It was almost, I have a science background and I entered this almost like a science experiment. In fact, Michael Tino and I bonded over our science backgrounds <laughs> years ago. But, um, and so we just started training and training. The good thing about it was the church was healing and growing like, growing like crazy, which meant critical mass kept moving further and further away because of growth. It's a good problem to have, but it is a problem. Um, and uh, I am glad to say that yes, the institution, the church will behave differently if you can reach that critical mass. Paula, people. can I ask real quick, can you explain Jubilee and what that is? Because I imagine a lot of folks don't know it. So it'd be great if you uh -huh. uh, let folks know what Jubilee is and Crossroads. Yeah, thank you, Asia. Uh, you know, we take things for granted so often. Uh, and the Jubilee training was an anti-racism training provided by our association. And the training that they provided was actually Crossroads Jubilee, uh, it, they didn't call it Jubilee, Crossroads Anti-Racism Training, but they allowed our association to contextualize it for Unitarian Universalists. So for the most part, the training was provided by Unitarian Universalists. Many of the trainers were ministers. And, um, and it's a weekend long training uh, that gives you an analysis. So you get common definitions of race, racism and other things, but also a common analysis. And that's where the power is, because when you can have a lot of people who have done that level of work, then you don't waste a lot of time and energy as is very often done debating about, about semantics, about methods or approach, none of that. I, I won't say none, but in my setting, you know, we're able to bypass all of that. Sometimes, a lot of times that's where everything dies in the debate. Right, so we bypass all of that. Everyone has this common um, analysis now, and the energy goes into actually doing work. Uh, and it takes place over the course of a weekend. So does that give you answer the question for you, Asia? Okay, thank you. So over time, um, because there's always turnover in our congregations, there's always turnover on our boards. If you're taking this work seriously, you've got to continually train. You can look up in four years, you could have had almost an entire board trained, and then four years later, no one left who has done the training. So if we're really serious about systemic change, you have to make resources available consistently. And one thing I want to say, I say this often, but it's good to have this forum for it. Jubilee training, the analysis of race and power, although yes, it can change over time, there are some foundational things that are consistent. And so when I hear people want to even refer to Jubilee as being out of date, and I tell them, think about eighth grade grammar. It doesn't matter whether you graduated in the 70s, 80s, or 2010. Eighth grade grammar is eighth grade grammar. There may be some things that change. Of course, I haven't been to school for a long time. But, but you got to get that basic um, information in order to move forward and to, to really be proficient in language. So Jubilee does that. And um, part of the evidence for me about um, that being true is that we have young adults who come into Jubilee and they, they do the training and say, everyone needs to do this. So if it wasn't relevant or if it was out of date, young people would be the first to let you know. And that's not the case at all. They have become a new engine for the work to take place in my home congregation. Now, so, on the larger, let me let me mention okay. on the larger uh -huh. scale, 
um, and the association, it has changed. It was, there, there was a certain, I think, curiosity about it early, which would have been the late 90s, maybe early 2000s. And, and then, um, I don't like the word schism, but I'm going to use it. Um, a, a schism kind of happened with the presentation of some work that challenged the Jubilee training. And so I think for people who hadn't done enough work yet, it was easy to see that as an off-ramp, which were a lot of people. And so some people continued to do it and others had their justification then for not doing it. Um, and then, so you move forward about a decade in, and there's less resistance. And I think what, part of what we have seen is, so every time you move forward with a new initiative, at least as it relates to race, you're going to experience a certain amount of resistance as part of the change process. Um, and then when the next iteration of it comes, and I'll explain this in just a moment, then there's a new resistance on, on that front and less resistance on the back end, right? And so if we talk about the, in terms of anti-racism, there were people who were saying, why do you need to call it anti-racism? Why are we against it? Why don't we talk about what we're for? But then when the Black Lives Matter movement came, all of a sudden anti-racism wasn't so bad, right? And then when the white supremacy call came, anti-racism is like peachy keen. <laughs> and, and white supremacy is the new front of resistance. And so I want to say that to say resistance is a part of the process. And um, we need to just be able to be in that space and continue to move forward. And people will eventually, it, it'll eventually get normalized. And, and then with the next, the next thing that is, um, feels, feels new and maybe scary to people than the old one all of a sudden, you know, is more widely accepted. And so it's just part of how humans develop over time. I was going to ask you, it seems, so the funding for Jubilee workshops and training trainers and all of that, which used to be pretty robust, um, does not exist anymore. Um, is there anything that's replaced it, in your opinion? Well, let me say, Meg, when I, when I first got the big picture, I, I thought, as nice as it was to be supplemented by the association, I thought it was strategically not the best solution because we could only move at the pace of the institutional budget, which meant we couldn't, we weren't really situated for transformation because it was all contained within the larger system around allocation of money. Um, so that was one. The second thing was, again, supplement, supplementation is good, but we weren't teaching people the value of the training. So, um, I always thought that it, we could do the training in a way that it pays for itself. And then if you can pay for each training as you go, then the only limitations were your ability to organize or the availability of trainers. And um, so I was never really reliant on the association training and we set a price per person that would pay for the package. And we just continue to make the training available. Uh, we do Jubilee trainings at my church still. 20 years later, we do it two to three times a year. We can't let up. If we really want this, we can't let up. Well, because as, as, oh, sorry, as you said, ev everyone needs a basic level of understanding of what here are the terms here are the definitions that we use in order for us to move forward so as new people come in they have to go through it and they have to get that um, so i appreciate that Aisha, what you had a 
Well, I was curious um, how many Jubilee trainers there are and do people still go through the UUA to set up a training or how, do, how does someone <laughs> set up a Jubilee training? Oh, you had to ask that publicly. <laughs> Um, I scratched that so, off the record. Let's pick something else. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pick something else. Well, we have very few trainers that are, have um, continued to train. Um, so it would be hard to meet a demand. But I am really hoping that, um, that the association would look at this again and find a way to invest um, so that we can bring more trainers along. And, and I say that, I just got an email yesterday. Um, well, a person is writing to their group. I won't say where they're located. And this person is saying, you know, when I took Jubilee four years ago, it changed my life. And this person is actually calling on their UU church to take a, a, state, a leading role in the state. Because as she said, you know, that, that, you all are doing the work around white privilege in a way in, in that location that no one else is, you know, step forward. And um, so it, it, Jubilee continues to change people's lives. I'm watching it every day. Um, and a new person at my church who is not UU and did Jubilee training just in July is this whatever you need to do, let me know. I support it. This work needs to be done in other agencies as well. So, you know, we, we missed a, a bigger opportunity that's not completely gone, but uh, it still has so much relevance and can really empower us to do some things that are um, critical. What I think Jubilee does so well it's been a while, but is really lay out power and talk about power in a way that for me was transformative back when I first did it. You know, the, the footprint analysis where, you know, they say if someone's kicking your butt, you ought to be able to ID their foot. So let's talk about the foot. You know, that, that was just such a useful way to think about it. And I think that that way of thinking about systemic power is a challenge for a lot of privileged people um, who, in my work in different congregations, um, and just living here in Minneapolis, which is one of those nice, you know, have a nice day racism places, um, where everybody's superficially very friendly, but the statistics are dismal on every front. Um, it's, I think it's, for me, that's the, that is the critical move that somebody has to take in order to do anything else, uh, is understand power and systems. And, and, um, and I'm curious if you see over, if you've seen people, when I say people, I mean people of privilege, white people, more able to, to take that leap, like, or is it still, because I just feel like, that's that's where the resistance absolutely yeah uh, hits is going from i treat everyone the same to there are systems at play jubilee is a paradigm changer and and that's what we have to rely on because it's too hard to try to unteach people what they've already learned um and i think one of the i know from my own experience and i think for many others Jubilee authorized us to look at our institution. So it shifted this um, general sense of racism as being an individual thing, you know, how a person thinks and behaves, to really looking at institutional structures and practices. But the power in it is that it authorizes us to do it. And one of the things that I've always thought was healthy about our association, Unitarian Universalist Association, as imperfect as we are, as imperfect as we do the work, as impatient as we are with ourselves around the rate of change, we have authorized self-examination. 
And I think many institutions, either out of need or preference, um, are not open to self-examination. And, and instead, problems, you know, I can remember when I was employed in the nine to five world, part of your job is to make sure that problems don't surface, right? Those of you who have worked it, so part of your job, you know, is I guess it's to be beyond criticism, the institution to be beyond criticism, which means a lot of things don't get addressed. And ours is very messy because we've authorized that self-examination and as imperfect as it looks, it's actually a healthier place because we stand a chance at getting at some of the causes and changing them as opposed to just changes that are superficial so that we look good as we move forward. We could do that, and we probably have done a lot of that, but transformation requires something else. It requires the level of honesty that is un uncommon in public. And um, we, we go there, you know? Uh, if we couldn't do that level of honesty, it would be very hard to recreate the, the culture that would be inclusive of all of us. And we're still working at it. Um, so I'm trying to, so I, I want to name, or I guess get your opinion on, <clears throat> I don't think there's consensus on what to do with folks who are looking for the off ramp. My thing is ignore them. Like you can, there's the exit. If you don't want to do this, you are not mandated. And yet there's sometimes um, folks who said, oh no, but it's important to counter. I mean, of course it's important to counter misinformation and yet I don't know, like you said, battle semantics, you know, battle of the semantics, how helpful that is. And I do want to name the schism you talked about. Um, someone called that after Jubilee was starting to get traction about, I think, 20 years ago, you said, um, it was actually a person of color who was very publicly against it and took the, the movement back about tw another 20 years, you know, held it up. And so that was probably one of the most heartbreaking things that I learned that it was, it was a black person who, who very publicly said, Oh, this is going to fail. It's terrible. And so, I mean, you don't have to comment on that, but I'm, I'm the way I've been, cause I've had the white supremacy teacher and I've had definitely black and brown folks not be happy with me and say, you know, what are you doing? And you're upsetting white people and you're, I mean, well, one person did say that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I say, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I, this isn't about anyone's feelings. So I, I, I hope that made yeah. sense. I guess my curiosity is, um, where do you focus your energy or how, what do you, do you have any energy to give to folks going on the off ramp? Yeah, so the tipping point is my strategy. I also come, I'm married to a person who has done a lot of organizational development and built organizations. And um, the National Association of Black Scuba Divers, we have a black dive club in Washington, D.C. And um, so I married into it, whether I wanted it or not, I was a part of it. But it was interesting because as we were building the National Association, uh, we would coach people in different states around how to develop their club. And uh, one of the things my husband used to always say is um, you only need about five people to get it started. And, um, and so our philosophy is really do it for those who will. And, and in building the tipping point, so the good news about the tipping point is you don't need everybody to make this work. There's the offering, right? You don't need the majority of the people to make it work. This is really good news if you ask me. And so it's, it's not the best use of your time to try to get there. And I've been in many sessions where people come kind of like almost crying. It's like, well, how do we get everyone? I say, you don't need everyone. So I, for me, my priority is helping to equip the people 
who will, the people who are ready. And I haven't run out of those people in these 20 years. So the more people who share the work, the analysis, and, and are in solidarity with each other and in community, what you end up doing is creating a new norm. And I liken it to an ecosystem. In an ecosystem, when one part of it changes, the whole system changes in relationship to it. So as we build those who will, the rest of the system will change. And I've, we've actually watched that as an association, if you can identify it. We've watched it happen over time. You know, I've watched it definitely in my home congregation. Um, so this is the way that my church identifies and behaves. Um, we worked up to adopting the eighth principle in uh, December 2017. And, you know, there were all kinds of people lined up ready to speak in favor of it because we had been doing the work. Another thing that people need to think about, there are people who come to the church because this work is being done, who join the church. I just had someone last Sunday, I preached at All Souls, and um, a, new, a person sat next to me and, and told me at the lunch hour and told me, you know, I'm not a member. I've been kind of coming once in a while off and on, but after today, I'm ready to join. This is what I want to do. And, and we hear a lot of that. So there's some people who are looking for a place that resonates with their values, their passion, their sense of what's just and unjust in the world. And if we're doing that work, they will find us. Um, and, and so let's, let's talk about the off-ramp because there's another uh, approach to the off-ramp. I've been talking about building a community of communities. That's a community within the church. It's always been there. We can expect it. For some people, just the change is not something that they want to engage in or that they're comfortable with or however you want to frame it. I want to honor that that's a choice. For some people, you can't do it fast enough. That's a choice. And there, there are just so many different interests and needs inside of our church. So if we create a community of communities, then there's a space for people who don't want to engage in that conversation. And we all still belong to the same community. It's in some ways, it's like theological, uh, the theological pluralism. You know, people are in different places, everything from liberal Christians to atheists and lots in between. And in a UU church, there should be space, right? for all of those variations. Well, I think we can look at this parallel to that. There are variations in people's um, orientation towards issues of race. Now, of course, we would love it if everyone would just embrace it. For some people, their, their socialization is very baked in and too hard to change. That's well, I'm, I'm wondering, is part of the strategy explicit or implicit to say if you are choosing that off-ramp here's your group and it's not going to be in the center exactly <laughs> so you you need That's to understand that you are choosing to marginalize like where you are uh it, or it's you, no you more are, that it's viewpoint no more is not going to be centered Exactly. It's no more important than, than, than any other group. And, and here's the thing. Our institution has to evolve with society. Unitarian Universalists have probably always done that. Maybe all institutions do it. I don't know. But we have to evolve with society. And for people who are not ready to go there, they should not be able to stop the institution from evolving. That is really, it's an ethical issue. It's not the ethical issue of whether we talk about race or not, whether we call something white supremacy or not. The ethical issue is whether or not we are evolving as an institution, whether or not we are able to let go of the old, outdated, historical, social and cultural structures that are in place 
and whether or not we are really able to embrace our, our full humanity and see other people as our community, as our people. And um, so that's the ethical issue, you know, inclusion or exclusion. That's the ethical issue. And when we center that, so, le so let me talk about the next piece. And that is, is all contained in this conversation. Churches have been looked upon as a family ever since I can think of, probably forever. And we're so comfortable with the metaphor of family and the language of family and church. It, it supports the kind of centering, Michael, that you're talking about of the something that really should not be the center of a church that's evolving. And um, families are, are hierarchical structures. They just are, they're not inclusive. Families are closed systems. I think, that's why Sunday morning is the most segregated hour, as it is said, because churches use a family metaphor, and that family boundary is pretty darn clear, right? Unspoken, but clear. Everyone knew when you were growing up, you knew what the rules were, you knew who had the authority, you knew who you could bring home and who you couldn't, you knew, you, you knew your place in the pecking order of the family. So we use that metaphor, and in some ways, we socially play it out and reinforce it. So what I am advocating for us is a cultural change to really look at ourselves as a community of communities and start to build equality into our relationships with each other. Equality is not built into our system. And that's what it took. It took me 20 years to be able to articulate it. I think we've been fighting against it all along, but I don't think that we've recognized it's not just the systemic nature of things. There is this conceptualized structure of family that we all accept and yet we are, we're constantly pushing for something else that we couldn't even name. We're pushing well, for and, equality. And, and that structure does not contain it. That structure of family has hetero patriarchy in it, right? Absolutely. So how can we talk Absolutely. about intersections of, of oppressions? That model, that model that we know who's, who's welcome to be invited to the table model is, um, needs to be queered up a bunch. <laughs> if, 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 yeah. we wanna, if we wanna continue to use that metaphor. Nope. Um, well, I'm know, saying we don't. You're saying toss the metaphor and I'm good well, with that. Don't throw it all the way out because the community then might function like that family, but the mm. church right. must be multiple communities not one family. And so the family metaphor doesn't have to go away. It's just not big enough. Can Another you say more too, about the community of communities? I'm, I'm trying yeah, to, to really get a dip. picture of it. Yeah. yeah, let me first address something that Michael pointed out. It, we talk about dismantling white supremacy. You can't do it if you don't have another structure. It is the structure, it is the family structure at the institutional level. White supremacy plays out that way. Um, so the community of communities gives us another structure by kind of flattening. So, so here's the other thing that that's, um, just comes along hand in hand with the family metaphor for church, individualism. We need to shift from, from individuals being the center to the communities being the center. And then our covenant needs to reflect that. And, and we should be covenant, our first covenant, and belief in the inherent worth and dignity of each person 
would then shift to belief in, in the inherent worth and dignity of each community and the well-being of each community and between communities. That's what we've been fighting for for all these years and we can't get there because our, our metaphorical structure makes us complacent to individualism. Is it? So the community of communities, it's already in place in every church, but we don't honor it. We have committees. We all, every church, almost every church has a religious education community, a music community. You've got the community of people who assemble on Sunday. You've got social justice communities. You've got your governance community. We've got a huge anti-racist community in our association. There are senior communities. Sure, the communities are already there, but we don't really make them the center. And we still allow, and think about this, an individual can raise their voice or their concerns and they can override what's in the best interest of all these communities. That should not be, but it's the structure that we have. We enable it. So it, it's the shift, like the GA title, I see you, Meg. It's the shift from I to we that we have not made. It's the shift from family, church as a family, to church as a community of communities. Now, my, my definition of beloved community now is a community of communities that are living out the eighth principle. And Tell eighth us about the eighth principle. Let's get to that. The and I just principle. want to flag that it looks like our viewers are really resonating with this community of communities idea. Yes. A number of people are posting about it and saying, yes, yes, yes. So yes, just to, yes. to say that, yeah, but you, tell us about where the eighth principle came from and what you think it brings that's missing. Yeah, the eighth principle really comes out of the anti-racism work. However, it, it finally got put into language. It really comes out of the eighth principle. Uh, I mean, out of the anti-racism work. And um, the, our principles were adopted 12 years before the association even agreed to do anti-racism work, but we never went back. So again, it comes out of, you know, this whole idea of, um, you know, we don't have to talk about race, that we can be inclusive just by being good and doing good ministry and living out our principles. And take what we just said about the family metaphor and what we all know about dominant culture. This was, it was never meant to be equal. I, in the service on Sunday, I, I read, you know, the beginning of the Gettysburg Address, what, that one came for last, the, the, the Declaration of Independence, the preamble to the Constitution, the Gettysburg Address. Go back and read those. And it, we talk about equality and liberty at a time when it was anything but that. It was never intended. It was never built in, but the documents promised it. Our principles promise something that we are not delivering because we haven't named racism and oppression. Those are those norms. So I talked about the ecology. When we get enough people who are changing it, and that is happening on the wider level, it will change. And we talk about resistance, white supremacy that we've seen. I, I, it has amazed me because at no time in my life, other than the last how many years, it was really 2008 when President Obama was elected. And, and let me say, I don't know what time it is, and you might want to leave time for questions. I had just come back from, um, from the pilgrimage with Bill Sinkford to Africa, 2008. We were there when the boats were being counted for President Obama. And while I was there, I did a crash course on apartheid, right? And when I came back, I was like, holy heck, I see it happening here. The rise of the Tea Party because apartheid was really a contemporary governance structure. And it was a group of small white nationalists in South Africa who ascended to power, statewide power in the country. 
and they they put in place this system, uh, this social hierarchy. Um, so I came back home and I was watching it budding here. And it was like, holy heck, everyone needs to learn South African history. There were parts of South African history that looked exactly, exactly in the museums. You would have thought you were in the segregated South in the United States, exactly. But we don't know our history well enough to stop it from repeating itself. And certainly it is repeating itself now. I'll stop there, Meg, and let you bring some people into the conversation or whatnot. I don't know if I answered your question You're muted, well Michael. enough about, about no, the I, I, principle. I'd love for you to state, because I, I read your eloquent statement about bringing together the pieces that are not ever put together. Um, and I, I just think that's a really critical under, again, you, you shift my paradigms, Paula Cole Jones. Now I'm yeah, thinking about community yeah. of communities. I love it. But I remember we did that around the accountability piece a few years back. Remember? That's right. That's right. <laughs> but if you can just say, because it seemed like you were, from your work with congregations, you saw this gap that, without overtly stating it, would continue to stop the work. I'm putting words in your mouth, but I read your statement. <laughs> That's where I got it. Well, um, you know, if you stay at the work long enough, and if you're true to it, you will see things in time. And the, the benefit of being able to work in a lot of different parts of the institution. So you can see the same resistances. And, and you know, it's, it's, I mean, people are not bad because they resist. They're just saying, I'm not ready to buy into that, right? And so, um, you know, coming up with structures that allow folks to be where they are, but also where we empower that forward edge. If we do not evolve as an institution, and I'm saying this to everyone now, if we do not evolve as an institution, we will become irrelevant, or we will become relevant to fewer and fewer people, and there's no future in that. Uh, Unitarian Universalist principles are everyday values for young people. Our churches should be overflowing with younger people, and mine is. How about yours, Aisha? Some people's churches are. Some people have recognized that. But it shouldn't be hard for us to draw in a younger community of people because we're offering something that many people need. You know, a lot of people come into a UU church and say, I, I sat there and cried the whole first day. Men and women, black and white, have told me that. I didn't know places like this existed. So we have a promise that we have not been making available to many, many people. And part of it is getting a culture of inclusion and moving this individualism out of the center and really nurturing the communities in our churches. I'll stop. I, it, in my in my congregate in East Shore Unitarian Church, um, the challenge the community uh, we have communities within communities, and a majority of them operate as um, clubs, and they're, they're very inter they're internally focused in a way mm -hmm. that uh, isn't inviting and. Um, talking about relevancy, we started to get young adults and we actually had one at a recent board me meeting came and cried because her husband who had been um, home and secure his, most of his young life, there was a vote to sell land and three quarters of an acre. Um, th so the vote of the congregation was, should we sell it to affordable housing, which felt like a no brainer or market rate. And keep in mind, the affordable housing would have gone for over a million, but the market rate was four, over four, and it went for market rate by, a, by the four, it was a 43 vote difference. Um, and people left. People said, I don't know what this is and why, you know, I mean, there's so many reasons why it was painful and, um, and, and then it, it felt irrelevant. It felt like, wow, we had a, a huge, I mean, when somebody asked me, I said, oh, we should give it back to the Duwamish because we're on Duwamish land and obviously for free, let them make the $4 million. But, you know, that wasn't even on, people just looked at me like they thought I was kidding. So 
to speak to your relevancy, it's like what I say about Unitarian Universalists is we never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. So this could have been something Im Im immensely impactful where we have a huge, huge epidemic of people without homes. Um, and, and we opted out of making a difference in that way. And so I, I, I love the idea of community within communities. And to me, having intention about affirming what the, because I believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person, not every idea. And so I think being mindful about what those communities are and that what still binds the thread that binds all those communities in community is unitary universalism. And as you said, right. the affirmation of the eighth principle. Yeah, and, and, and one of the things that makes a community of communities different than what we have now is that um, each of those communities would have a representative as you approach a specific issue and they would represent the community in a conversation about the, the whole community. What's, what's in our common, what's the common good here? The common good, right? Instead of, um, you know, some individuals can make their case stronger, better than others. But that's not what this is about. And so the communities together collaborate and collectively make, make decisions around various things. That doesn't mean all of them might be a decision that doesn't require everyone to weigh in. So if you go online and look up sociocracy, you can get a lot of information on how a community of communities would operate. And it, it, it's a form of self-governance. So we've got policy governance. So say that again. So sociocracy, like um, S O C I A, Chrissy, like that. Yes, like democracy, the sociocracy. Yeah, um, and so it's something for us to learn. And what excites me is that it's accessible to everyone in our association now. You know, you don't have to go through. Even with Jubilee, we had a fairly narrow channel. Um, that we ourselves can't fully resource. Uh, hopefully we'll resource it better in the future. But sociocracy is already a system. There are people around the country who do that kind of training and facilitation. And I'm actually working on a plan to try to get an online training for our people. And so um, you could have representatives from various churches who would engage, you know, sign up for the online training and learn more about it. We need to build this capacity into our churches. Yeah. Oh, in Asia, that situation is, the, you know, we miss a lot of opportunities, but it's still an opportunity to examine uh, how that happened and what the, what different, it's almost like what uh, playback, not playback theater, but the, uh, theater of the press, where you could look at the different ways that this could have played out. Uh, it could be a great learning opportunity for the church. To their credit, that's happening now. The board, um, yeah. I have to give kudos to the board, uh, the board of trustees, that they are looking at that. And there's a commitment that's been made to look at a different aspect of white supremacy culture at each board meeting. And for me, after from you know, two years ago, having had, they're not there anymore, but there were board members who literally yelled at me for using the words white supremacy. It was, I could have wept in... Mm -hmm. just um, affirmation of, wow, this same congregation uh, is examining what happened and what can be lessons learned. And I understand that those tears, they've happened to me time and time when, you know, I looked up and it's like, wow, this is relief that you didn't know was there when you can see the system actually doing the work and, you, and when you've been holding it for so long and then it's happening, it's like, wow. Paula, oh, how do you think we're doing nationally at building the tipping point? Where do you see us? So, you know, it's really been good that I've been on, on the UUA staff in, in this interim period, one to two years. I don't want people to mistake that like a, like now forever because I'll be back in my freelance role soon. But um, the association is really doing the work. And I wouldn't have known that if I were not a part of the staff and then, you know, monthly meetings. The association at the national level is really committed to doing the work. I'm watching it. The um, diversity in hiring is happening. So all of that work around white supremacy and the blow up that we had, um, it, we learn more 
<laughs> when we have those kinds of um, problems and crises than we do when things are good. We learn more. And um, it's unfortunate that, you know, because there's always loss, but it's good that we do learn and that something moves forward. I, I think that uh, the emotional aspect of the, the crisis and, and even rejection to a certain point, I think that that emotion is, is I, re I really see it as the biochemistry of change. And if we're making all of the changes just here cognitively and we're not feeling it, that we're not embodying it, I don't know that those changes are sustainable. But the ones that we embody, we feel it happening, I think that's where the real magic of transformation is happening. Yeah. Well, we see Aisha Hauser, one of the magicians who orchestrated that one. And Paula yeah. Cole Jones, it's been wonderful to catch up. Anything we didn't ask you that you'd like to say? Because we're about out of time. Um, oh, only one thing. We have a new program now, Jubilee Kids, that we are, yeah. And it comes out of the anti-racism training jubilee training parents who say well do you have anything for our children and at that time we didn't and now we do um, and uh, the curriculum was basically written by sheila Shu, who's an extremely talented and committed uh, director of religious education in rochester new york so we're 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 starting to introduce it to religious educators and trying to figure out how do we how do we replicate it? How do we make this available as a resource? So we can't do it for you right at the moment, but it's coming soon. Thank you. It's been wonderful to have this conversation. Uh, we haven't shared a lot of the cheering that's been going on from the sides on the folks who are watching. Thanks for watching and listening. And um, yeah, next week, um, let's see. Okay, none of us will be here. <laughs> Except I'll be Antonia. here. Yay, Antonia! Next week we have Shige Sakurai talking about non-binary um, identities and spirituality and the International Day of Pronouns. So tune in. All right, and we will have hosts too, I promise. They'll be great. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good to see you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, Paula. You're welcome.